for those of you who are lucky enough to be here and to li listen to the lecture on diffusion, uh, we're going to continue about d diffusion. And we remember that last time x squared was some number for one dimension. It was the number 2 times d, the diffusion constant, times time. And that is significantly different than normal motion. Normal motion being directed motion, where what is the equivalent for the relationship between your position and your time when it comes to normal directed motion? X is equal to one, what, what, <coughs> for, for normal motion, what, what it, what, what's, the, what is F of T? Is equal to velocity times, so these are linearly related to each other. Where in this case, x squared, for example, x squared, actually the average value of x squared equals 2 dt. So what does this mean in terms of I don't know. What does it mean? What, why are these fundamentally different? <coughs> what, what, why are these so different? So is diffusion good over a really small distance or a really large distance? And what do I mean by is it good? Okay, think about it. You have a minute. So the, the question is, if you're going over a very short distance, is one of these going to be good? In that if you're going to go over a short distance, can you do it rapidly with this? Or can you do it rapidly with that? Hmm. Go ahead, talk about it. Participate too. <laughs> makes it easier to cross. What does that mean? Like if it has to diffuse a long, a larger, like a longer distance or whatever, like the likelihood that it does so successfully is like way less. I don't know how to explain it. That, that's right. I don't know what's wrong with this. 
Okay, so I've answered the question, and now uh, I've gotten fairly confused as to what the answer is. Does anybody know? How do you go about thinking about it? You had plenty of time to talk about it. You came up with some answers that I'm sure were wrong, and I would love to hear them. <coughs> love to hear them. OK, yes. So the diffusion is sufficiently fast for small distances, like from one side of the cell to another. So like 100 microns to like one side of the heat. So diffusion is sufficiently fast. Why? Because the cell is so small. OK, so that implies. So, so x is very small, so therefore t is very small. So x is very small. So you're going, uh, uh, you know, it, it, sort of one dimension. You're saying if x is very small, is that right? Yes. So x is very small. So you know, in some units, x is much, much less than 1. That's what you mean by very small. And therefore, in this case, x equals some velocity times time. So, so what, what do you get? You get that t is very small. Right? And what, what happens here? I'm just trying to maybe quantify a little bit what you're talking about. I'm not disagreeing with you. Well, maybe I am disagreeing with you. So, I mean, no, no. I, I, by the way, I'm not. But I'm just figuring, get a little jolt out of our. In a qualitative sense, uh -huh. um, if t is small enough that the cell can tolerate that kind of so for example, oxygen diffusing from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell. If in that case it's small enough, the cell does not need to use energy to, to do active transport using regular velocity. Yeah. OK, you're giving a lot of interesting examples and the size of a cell and oxygen going and so forth. That, and in fact, we will get to that. And that's, that's good. But what you're saying is if x is much less than 1, very small, right, then x squared is much less than 1, right? Yes. And therefore, t is what? t is what? <coughs> Very, very small. <coughs> so if x is is very small is small, diffusion wins, that is, you know, to go a distance x takes very very little time via Diffusion. And, and that actually makes a certain amount of sense, because 
What is diffusion? Diffusion is a molecule here, and it's sort of going all over the place. Why? Because water molecules are hitting it and it goes that way. A little bit later, it hits that way, it goes that way. But eventually, you know, it goes a certain distance via the random motion. And if the distance is, you know, short, it, it can go there quite rapidly, where if it's long, man, it takes forever. So that says, if you have an object Does diffusion require an external source of energy? You say no. Well, wait, why not? Why doesn't it require an external source of energy? Guys right here. Well, it is an external source in that it's like some water molecules hitting it and going randomly. But it's not an external source in the sense of like an ATP driving it. So when you, what this means is that when you have to go only short distances, you can rely on diffusion. You don't need any external source of energy. You can just rely on thermal energy. And we'll go over that a little bit. Okay, and that's basically short distances, diffusion of small molecules are very good. And biological examples, we'll talk about bacteria versus eukaryotic cells. It's actually interesting. Evolution has relied exactly on this fact. And it turns out, we'll get to it, that bacterial cells are really small. Right? They're really small. Diffusion is fine for, to get things from one end of the bacteria to the other. You don't need things like molecular motors, which rely on ATP. A eukaryotic cell tends to be larger than a bacterial cell. So to get, get, to go from one end of a eukaryotic cell to another end, diffusion takes too long. And for that reason, they need things like molecular motors, which is what we have. So bacteria don't have molecular motors. <coughs> Eukaryotic cells do. The other thing was oxygen transport. How close cells need to be to give up their oxygen or to take oxygen, and for example, to give up carbon dioxide. And it turns out that that is operating in your lungs all the time. And the most amazing example I want to, I will give to you has to do with the stopping behavior of bacteria. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll wait for the answer. You'll wait for the answer, because it's really neat. Okay, so, so you just, to go out over what diffusion is. You have diffusion, you put a little spot of something dark, it will have, so you put it in like this, water molecules will come in, hit, And it jiggles around, and eventually it spreads. 
Why does it jiggle, jiggle around? It jiggles around because there's water molecules hitting it. So by the equipartition theorem, it has one half of KBT is equal to one half if it's if its energy goes like the square of any parameter, goes like the square of x squared, or I mean, goes like x squared, or goes like v squared, it will have one half kT. So in this case, it has an energy of one half mv squared. So the velocity will be equal to something in general. It, it depends on the temperature. And eventually, it looks like that. Okay. What's the velocity of water molecules at room temperature? Go ahead, calculate it. Wait, what? Why do we care? Who cares? Yeah, how come? Oh, you're ju just stretching. How, how, how come, how come, why do I ask that, this? Yes? Because if it's moving slowly, then when it hits something, it won't impart as much momentum, and so it, you can look at a brown motion, but if you don't know how fast the water molecules are going, it's like kind of, yeah, exactly. So I, I want to show that the water molecule is moving fast enough that when it hits some object, you know, gives a, a significant punch to it. Okay, so you tell me. Go ahead. How many degrees of freedom do we have? I don't know. You, okay. you, you, you figure it out. Okay, uh, uh, does everybody have their homework turned in? Because at this point, it's late, if it is. Homework at 9.30, I said, yeah, she was syncing it up on my computer. I know. The, the, these are going to be worthwhile. Sort of like man who has calculator, he's ready. You talked about the system about this question as well, like the previous one. So, okay. if you, said there is, you said like there is no external like force or energy for diffusion. But as far as I know, like there should be like potential difference in the system. Otherwise, I'm like, for instance, like you have different concentration. That's a driving force for diffusion, like go from point A to point B. So, do you count that as an external? No, in that fundamentally, diffusion does not re require any external I input of energy. There, okay. Yeah. So, uh, like, if versus, like, you have something at point A, something at point B, for, like, one atom to go from A to B, there should be some interest from A, like, in B for him to go. No, it, no. In Otherwise, fact, it's just, like, it can go this way. That's right. It can go any way, but there's some chance that the molecule of A will go to B. And if that is, in fact, what it is, is its chance. So, that, I mean, first, in the case of the ink you've shown, like, you have one drop of ink on top, and it, like, reached to the bottom as well? Yeah. So, you know, it reached to the bottom because, like, there is a concentration difference between, like, ink concentration from the top to the bottom. So yeah, but it, 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 imagine just that there is one drop. 
one, one, atom. one atom. And y you look at how it goes. And you can, it, he did this last time, you, you know, plot the disk. like randomly go somewhere. That's right. That will actually be the exact same thing as if you had, had now imagine that you have two, two atoms. The, 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 this is, by the way, a very good point, uh, and I, I'll talk to you about it afterwards. Okay. So, oh, it, it's it's that funny, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. Look at that. It was. What? Why is it that funny? Oh, you have several people smiling. There we go. Physics is fun. And biophysics is more fun. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. So, what's the answer? Now that you're busy smiling and laughing. Um, I, I got, we got um, 374.8 years per second. Oh, wait, it's 374.8? You sure it's not 374.8? Eight four or eight five. Eight per point. Something around that, approximately. In what? What are the units? Meters per second. Meters per second. But how did you decide? How did you do that? Uh, KBT is equal to one half m d Okay, the, the, there is within, uh, should be one half, or it should be maybe th three halves, depending on the number of degrees of freedom. Okay, and uh, I get 630 meters per second. You know, I'm not worried about factors of two. So 630 meters per second, for those of you who are metrically impaired, that's 1,300 miles per hour. <coughs> wow. At room temperature, a molecule is really whipping around. And that's why it, it can impart some energy. OK, but now, so you're coming in really fast. How far does a molecule go before it hits another water molecule? So why do we care about this? Tell me, what, why do we care about this? Let's say if the distance is really far, it comes in, it hits it, and then the object gets some momentum and goes for quite a ways. If, on the other hand, it's really close, it hits it, and then a little bit later, it gets hit again. And a little bit later, it gets hit again. That is, it's, it, the motion, while the, it, it's really huge, it lasts for only a really short period of time. Okay, let's see. So how far does a water molecule go before it hits another water molecule? Or, so how do we figure this out? Any ideas? Okay, go think about it. Go do it. You have, you have, you have two minutes. Do you know? Do you this session looks like cold water. A, what is this? B, so this one. What? What? What, what am I asking for? Okay. So, what do you have to know about that? 
Good. Okay. What's the density of water? Sure, you know it. What What is the density of water? Good. What What's the density of water? One right. Right. One gram per mL. Okay. So that's a certain number of water molecules per centimeter cubed. And therefore, you can get the average distance between them, right? Because one gram, is, how much is in a gram? Huh? Eight, right? And then, exactly. Okay, so, we have the, the beginning of it. How, how do we do this? Yes? Um, well, I think you could, so your water is one gram per milliliter. Good, yes. And you know that water is, I think, 18 grams per mole. Good. So from that, you can get the moles of water per milliliter, and that would catch you the molecules per milliliter, and then you can uh, How do you go from moles to molecules? Um, well, one mole is like, talk about it, number many molecules. Great. Okay, so you get the number of molecules per milliliter, and then you want, go ahead. Um, well, from there, well, I guess if you really space, you should then start roughly yeah. on average. I'm not exactly sure how you did the answer. I didn't through the whole thing, but I know that that's probably where you would start. Yeah, it, you're, you're totally on the right track. Okay, you know the number of molecules per milliliter. What is milliliter? In ter is what? How many meters is it? Or it's one cubic centimeter. One cubic centimeter. And then if we assume it's you know, evenly spaced out, we get the number of molecules per centimeter cubed, and then you take the cubed root, and so you get some sort of the number of mo molecules per nanometer or whatever, and then you can reverse that. Basically, you have the number of molecules <coughs> per nanometer and so forth. And so oh, or density of water, one gram per centimeter cubed. Basically, we therefore get the average di distance. Okay, and then we get, so the average distance is something. And then how much time between the water molecule coming and knocking another molecule there and a second molecule? Well, that's just the distance that the water molecule divided by its velocity, which velocity we just calculated. It was like 13 miles per, 1,300 miles per hour. So the answer is the time between the collision, the 1,300 miles per hour is like, sorry about the writing, is like a picosecond. So you get this enormous force, but one picosecond later, it's 10 to the minus 12, you get another molecule comes in and starts sending the molecule off in yet another direction. And then another molecule sends it off in another direction. That is, the H2O and small molecules, they're undergoing a random walk. They're moving very fast, but then the direction of motion changes very often. Okay, and what he did is 
he derived for you last time that x squared is equal to 2 dt, where d is l squared, which is the sort of length between the time that the, the water molecule needs to go to hit it, and the delta t. And it, what, what you're going to do for homework is in n dimensions, we have x squared, the average is equal to 2 dt, so that's one dimension. For three dimensions, or for two dimensions, it's x squared equals 4 dt. And for three dimensions, it's x squared equal to 6 dt. So what I want you to do is to derive that. Okay, so this is, again, just a review of last time. So initially, we put a drop of, for example, the ink right over here, and then we find that with time, it sort of broadens out. And again, the width of this goes like the square root of time. Okay, one thing about this is we say that x squared equals to some number times d times tau. What is d? And it turns out that due to Dr. Einstein, we can actually calculate it. And what he did, I'm just going to give you the result, is that D is equal to KBT over F, where F is some friction factor. And the friction factor for a round object is equal to 6 pi times eta, which is the viscosity, times r times the radius of the bead. And that's known as the Stokes-Einstein equation. And it, it, if you were to be so fortunate as to derive this, and then if you published it in 1905, you should have gotten a Nobel Prize. But in fact, I, I don't know if anybody knows the story here. It's amazing. Einstein published three articles in the same journal at the same time. What were they? One was the nature of the diffusion constant. What else? Special relativity. Special relativity. And, and what? Splitting of an atom. Photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect. Each one of those deserved a Nobel Prize. He didn't get it. Because, I don't know, relating where D comes from, I don't know, I guess, Maybe they didn't understand it or whatever. Relativity, well, that was obviously nonsense. Seriously, it was not believed by the people who gave out the Nobel Prize. And then, well, the photoelectric effect, it wasn't believed at first, but, you know, it ended up being right. So we'll give him a Nobel Prize for that. And he never, ever got a Nobel Prize for either special relativity or the diffusion. Okay, now the only thing is D is related to 1 over F or 1 over 6 pi eta R is not always true. 
It's true where the so-called Reynolds number is low. And that is, it, the Reynolds number is low is when the flow is sufficiently slow that you don't have eddies and vortexes. That is, it's characterized by smooth, constant flow motion. That is, the flow is laminar, where the viscous forces are dominant. It's fairly complicated, but we'll see in a second, actually, you, all of you will be able to relate to this. Who likes caramel? Who, who, who kind of finds it gross? I find it dangerous. Find it dangerous? Yeah. Why do you find it dangerous? Uh, I feel like caramel is a choking hazard. Okay, so when you're all enjoying caramel <laughs> and the, don't. Yeah. Personally, wait, there was another person who didn't like. Yeah, what's the problem with caramel? Yeah, actually, I agree, but whatever. We'll see about caramel. Is caramel, is that have a high visco, uh, um, uh, a low Reynolds number or a high Reynolds number, just to get you used to? Uh, uh, very low. You know, you set in motion and sort of things kind of just keep going, you know. It's not like you have a river, you know, which is whoosh. Okay, that's in contrast to turbulent flow, which is the, you know, whoosh. Got that? Whoosh. That, that was pretty good. Who, who did that? Wow, okay, let's say one, two, three. Whoosh. Did everybody do it? No, I, okay. Everybody do it. I, I, I'm just being in a weird mood today. Okay, Wh okay, so one, two, three, whoosh. Okay. Ready? No, 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 no. One, two, three. Whoosh! I didn't see everybody doing it. One, two, three. Gosh. Okay, so let me let me do it. Oh, so by the way, you can calculate what D is and about something like 250 microns squared for, per second for a small molecule in water. Okay. This is the idea of Reynolds number. Hopefully this works. <coughs> oh, I can't believe it. Okay. Every... This is ridiculous. Everybody, you have uh, two, two minutes. Could take a break because I, I got to get this going because this is good. Okay. Everybody ready? Woo. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if the sound is going to come from this. This was a TV commercial. Ah, oh, it doesn't. On the other hand, uh, I went to uh, Vail, Colorado, and this is what 
So before, if you swim in caramel, everything's really slow. The Reynolds number is really low. So that's good. And as opposed to, this is going to be short. OK, anyways, you're not that impressed. OK, so the point is, as long as you don't have turbulence, the value of d is very reasonable. And there you get like 250 microns squared per second. OK, and let's give some examples of this. And remember, I had previously given this to you. Uh, it's about neurons. And remember, there's like 100 billion neurons, that a neuron is a neur nerve cell is the same thing, in your brain. So some a little stupider people have like 80 billion, and re really smart people have 100 billion. So, OK, that's well smart, so let's say it's 100 billion. And each nerve is connected to another nerve. It's very, very, very highly parallel processing. A typical nerve is connected to a thousand other nerves. It's connected via a synapse that is from one nerve, has an axon, which then comes into what's called the dendrite. And they, they're connected via this synapse. And the synapse works, one that is one communicating cell to another communicating cell, is they're not actually touching. There is a small gap, like about 20, 40 nanometers across. And what it does is when one fires, the way it fires is it releases glutamate, which is a small molecule. So it, it's diffusion is pretty high. And it just releases the glutamate. The glutamate is over here. And now it wants to interact with other proteins on the cell surface. And the question is, how long is that going to take? Can you just rely on diffusion? Or do you have to, for every single thought that you have, do you have to use up some ATP? So how do we do it? We, we all right now can do this. Yes? Don't we use like a chemical gradient to make sure it happens so it is diffusion, but it's like we control the, um, the gradient so it's like, it's not facilitated diffusion, but we like make sure that diffusion happens the right way? Well, it, yeah, yes, of course, yes. Uh, uh. <coughs> made in the vesicles. The, the vesicles eventually fuses, and the glutamate comes out of here. So in, in that sense, it, it is, there is a gradient in that the, it's, the glutamate starts with you know, a, a little pulse over here. And, but then they diffuse. And, what I'm saying is, I want to know this is made, you know, 20 to 40 nanometers. And remember what we said is that in order, if we only have to go a short distance, diffusion should be very efficient. Is that true? This ultimately determines how fast you think. Whoa, that would be really something like going in for a test, get a little, you know, this is glutamate, get a little glutamate enhancer, and 
No? Okay. Tell me, how fast does, does this take? Go ahead. You, you, huh? Oh, well, good. What's D? What is D? Huh? Ah. Well, okay. What is the units? What? 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 What is the the units of this? What? At length divided by time or time? <laughs> length squared. How do I know it's length squared? X squared is equal to whatever six dt or two or whatever. So this is. For example, like micron squared divided by seconds is equal to D, so that, so that's right. So it's 250 micron squared per second. Okay, so go ahead. Do it for me. Tell, tell me on average how long it takes. Also, oh. What is the distance? Twenty to uh, to forty nanometers. I guess there I said thirty to hundred. That that's kind of big. Twenty twenty to forty nanometers. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to convert the nanometers to micrometers, so I don't have to worry about the square. That's square. Um, so then just that square divided by 2D. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some of you people are rapidly typing away at your calculator. Who, who is the answer? Or how, how do you do it? Eric, do you have the answer? Mm. Did, how, how how far is it? Twenty, but what? Twenty nanometers. Into where? Okay. So we have 20 nanometers squared is equal to 6 times what? Times D times 250 micron squared per second times T. And then solve for t. Okay, so we, we just have to be a little bit careful about the units. For example, convert this to microns. The, what is 20 nanometers in terms of microns? Yeah. So, isn't that right? Micron. Squared, and, and you get it. And the the answer is on the order of twenty microseconds. Wow, you guys are fast thinkers, and that's exactly right. 
evolution has made it really, the synapse is very small such that you can think, you don't need to sort of use external energy, you can just rely on KT. So if you take a test and it's during the winter, you know, in the winter it's a little colder and you know, that you're a little stupider. <laughs> So next time that you take a test, like maybe in a psychology class or a philosophy class, and you can just raise your hand and it's like, oh, it's cold, too cold today. I'm like feeling really stupid. No? Okay. Yes? Oh, it, 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 is this actually thinking? Well, yes and no. That, that is, it, this is the, the time it takes from one neuron to fire and communicate with another neuron. Now actually a thought is actually, you know, one neuron connecting to another neuron which is connecting to a neuro, another neuron. So, in fact, you think more slowly than, you know, these, the few microseconds that we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Based on what we dealt with here, can we describe hallucination? Well, like the, 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 what we've calculated here is, again, just the time that it takes for one neuron to fire and for the chemical to come across. That there is then a lot of other steps that lead to hallucination or thought and things like that. And the, the point is that this is not the rate limiting step. I mean, so can, can you say anything about hallucinations? I, I would suggest you go and do an experiment. And no, you know, your professor always tells you that hallucination is bad and you shouldn't do drugs. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, diffusion is fast enough to go across the synapse. Okay, so just real briefly, diffusion, x squared equals 60t. So if the molecule gets bigger, x and d goes up or down? How, how, how do we do this? We see x squared equals 6 dt, and d is, is what? kbt over f, which is kbt over what? What's f? 6 pi over. 6 pi eta r, that is, you know, for just a round object. Okay, so if the molecule gets bigger, what does that mean? R is getting bigger, so D is smaller. Smaller, hey, what do you know? Ah, now, we want to get to eukaryotic and bacterial cells and to show that, you know, this really has co consequences. Okay, a bacterial cell is, is how big typically? A micron. And a eukaryotic cell 
is typically what? A hundred microns or, I don't know, 10 to 100 microns. So in this case, it takes, but this is a, a eukaryotic cell, is it takes about 16 milliseconds for an oxygen molecule that enters the cell to, to go, go across it. Ultimately, the 16 milliseconds, that limits how fast you can do things. <coughs> So the metabolism of bacteria is much higher than eukaryotes because, in fact, the oxygen, it comes in and can immediately, or so fairly rapidly, go to all parts of the bacterial cell. When eukaryotic, it takes a while. Therefore, the size of the eukaryotes is limited by size. That is the diffusion constant of oxygen. As the size gets bigger, everything happens more slowly. You know frogs? You know, a female frog is basically a big sack of ovaries, which has oh, what are called oocytes. They're little. What, what are they? They're, huh? Eggs. And if you actually look at them, the eggs are huge. They're like a millimeter or two in diameter. Absolutely huge. And so an egg basically can't hardly do anything. And every cell in your body essentially needs to be within 50 to 100 microns of an oxygen source. For you, where, do you, where does a cell get oxygen from? It, it's because some capillary is nearby. Okay? So what you're going to do for homework is you have a blood supply over here and you have a little sack. The little sacs are generally called alveoli in your lungs. And you have oxygen in here and you have little blood cells in here, and it needs to just diffuse the oxygen, diffuse from here into here, and the carbon dioxide from here to here. If you had to rely on an external source to actually go and pump the oxygen and the carbon dioxide, you'd, you'd get really tired. But in fact, you'll see that diffusion works just fine. And in order for diffusion to work, the distance must be small enough that you get it in a reasonable period of time. What, what is a reasonable period of time here? What's, what's reasonable? The time yeah. it takes for a red blood cell to pass through. Exactly, the time it takes for a red blood cell to pass through. So the blood cell is here, and then a here, and then in here, and here. It better be spending enough time in here that the oxygen can go and the carbon dioxide can go <coughs> around. And you'll actually calculate this.
Okay, this is the, the last thing. <clears throat> is we're going to study how bacteria move. And basically what to conclude is that inertia doesn't matter at all. Okay, so if you have a bacteria, it's typically one to three microns, and it has a little flagella on the back of the bacteria, and it basically it goes and, you know, it moves along something like this. And that gives it some forward propulsion. And it turns out that it goes about 25 microns per second. So how many body lengths per second, just to get an idea if these guys are good swimmers or not, how, how far is that? Well, 25 divided by, you know, one or three microns means it's on the order of 10 body lengths per second. Is that good? How, how fast do you guys go? No, I, I swim. It's, you know, I really struggle, you know, as opposed to, well, back in my day it was Mark Spitz. Uh, who, Phelps, Phelps. So how fast does Phelps go in terms of body lengths per second? Yeah, he, he does about two body lengths per second, which is amazingly fast. It, for most ordinary humans, like me, like I go about one body length per second. He goes twice as fast. That's sick. That's, anyways, so he goes two body lengths per second. So these guys are really pretty amazing. Okay, anyways. Okay, so the bacteria are good swimmers. Okay, now, if you turn off a propeller, how fast does the, the bacteria go? Uh, how fast does it stop? Like, if, if I'm going in the pool, you know, I go like this, and then I go like this, I, I just stop. Do, do I... Do I stop? No, I, I go, you know, I don't know, what, maybe a body length or two or something like that. That's saying that my inertia actually matters, right? That is, the, for, the past history matters for macroscopic things. What do you think for microscopic things? What's ha actually happening? You turn off the, your propeller, and then what happens? You stop. Why? Th think about it in for terms of diffusion. What's happening? <coughs> come on, come on, come on. It, we don't have a lot of time. What happens? It, the, there's water molecules bashing you all around. So the fact that you, you stop propelling yourself, basically immediately, you, for, you, you just totally forget about it. Okay, so let's see. So how far does a bacteria coast? Well, you do F equals MA. What forces are left on the bacteria? Well, MA equals M dV dt minus the force of friction is equal to minus gamma, which is the drag coefficient, times of the velocity. The velocity is linear in V, that is, we have low Reynolds number. What is the drag coefficient? What does it depend on? The goopiness of the fluid, obviously the viscosity, the dimension of the object, obviously the bigger the object, the harder it is to move. 
the drag is equal to, the, so gamma is equal to six pi eta r. R is the viscosity, V is the velocity, which we said is like 25 microns per second, and C is just a constant. I, I realize I'm going over this fairly fast, but I hope you get the ideas. The diffusion constant is KBT over F. The drag is F times V. So you solve the equation. MA is equal to minus gamma V. That is, MA is basically just the drag force, because you don't have the propeller moving you at all. The drag force is minus gamma V. What it, m dv dt equals minus gamma v. So how do you solve this? You multiply both sides by dt, and you divide both sides by v. So you get m dv divided by v is equal to minus gamma times dt. Then you integrate that m dv over v is equal to m times the ln of v, which is equal to gamma minus gamma t over m. So the velocity is equal to the initial velocity times e to the minus gamma over m times tau. So the velocity is equal to some initial velocity times e to the minus t over tau where tau is m over gamma. Okay, so what is the mass of the bacteria? What, what is the mass of the bacteria? How, how would you estimate that? Mostly it's water. Yeah, mostly it's water. Okay, so what? You have the volume, you know the density, just... Yeah, exactly. The volume, you know the density, therefore you can get the mass. <coughs> okay, it turns out to be four times 10 to the minus 15 <coughs> kilograms. We plug in the number. And then we get tau is equal to m over gamma, is 0.2 microseconds. That's 200 nanoseconds. So the bacteria, once it's, for, it's forgotten to propel itself, it stops in about 200 nanoseconds. That is like no time. So basically, it's forgotten the fact that it was ever being propelled. So, how much does the bacteria coast? Okay, once forces are turned off, the bacteria forgets about history very quickly. That is, history does not matter. That is, inertia is completely irrelevant for bacteria. How, does, how far does the bacteria coast in 0.2 seconds? Well, the distance is equal to the integral of velocity dt, which is v naught e to the minus t over tau naught. You get that the bacteria, it stops in 200 nanoseconds, and it goes 0.05 angstroms, which, you know, is less than the diameter of a hydrogen atom. I mean, to a certain extent, it, you know, it, one doesn't want to take it that seriously. But the point is, it goes, it shuts off its motor, it basically stops in, immediately, doesn't coast hardly at all. So, you know, for me, if I was going along, you know, and swimming like this, and I stop, how far do I go? 
well, if I'm the size of a bacteria, I go basically nowhere because it simply doesn't matter in the past that I was going. So, okay, we, we, we've done that. Let me give this to you because I'll have this in the homework. The drag force on bacteria, the bacteria is going along, it's moving at about 25 microns per second, going about 10, 10 body lengths. In a period of 200 nanoseconds, after it shuts it off, it's, it, it goes to the velocity of zero. The force is equal to delta P over delta T. So that means the average force is half a picanewton on it. Where the weight is, which is equal to mass times G, is 0.04 picanewtons. So what that means, the bacteria is swimming as if they're in 10 times their own weight. That is really impressive. The fact that the bacteria can do anything, you know, it, it's propelling each other as if it's basically swimming in concrete. Pretty amazing. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll forget about this. Okay, so you have two minutes. So the point is, Bacteria are really amazing swimmers. They're effectively acting as if they're swimming in concrete. And in fact, once they stop swimming, they s slow down to basically zero as if they are indeed in, co in concrete.